Okay, so we are recording officially. Equipment and supplies. Students, students must adhere to all the Haverford equipment room policies and please report any damage to departmental equipment or materials. The last thing we want is for Dan to arrange to have you borrow a camera. Something's wrong with the camera. Who, who knows what it could be? Cameras do malfunction sometimes. If you notice there's a malfunction from a camera that you borrowed from the, from the department, please let Dan know so that he can take it out of the system so it doesn't get loaned to someone else. Um, we're not gonna hold you responsible if there's no ne negligence, if you didn't throw it off the top of a building or something like that out of anger. Um, but things do happen to the cameras and we just wanna make sure we are, we're loaning out cameras that work properly. Okay, so the required equipment, you're gonna need one 35 millimeter camera with a normal lens. If it so happens that you can borrow from a family member, some of your parents may have been photography buffs or are photography buffs. If they have a medium format, that would be acceptable. Um, but whatever format you work in for your main assignment, you must stick with throughout the entire coursework. So if you, if you wanna shoot 35, fine, two and a quarter, four by five, everything that we're gonna go over now, that'll be your format for the entire course, okay? Uh, 10 rolls of 35 millimeter film and ASA options I'm gonna discuss right now. Since you don't know anything about ISO and ASA, when I delve into the, the technical lecture, you're gonna learn a little bit more about it. But very simply, the lower the ASA number, the more sharpness, the more resolution and less grain. Black and white photography is a grainy medium because of the chemical structure of the film. So as you go up in ISO, let's say 400, 800, 1200, whatever it is, you will start to pick up more grain. So just, just keep that in the back of your mind. That's an aesthetic decision that you will make. The department will provide negative file archival preservers for 35 millimeter film that you'll be developing in our lab. And the department has a limited supply of loaners for short term use to get started. Dan generally doesn't like to lend cameras out for the entire semester because other students may need or want it because of COVID. We might have, might be able to stretch that out a little bit. Um, Dan will chime in in a few minutes. He's only going to be with us for a short while. So um, printing. Students should anticipate spending approximately two to $300 on paper for printing. Uh, the class is required to use. This is, this is what I want you to use. Dilford multi-grade fiber-based glossy. That's what I use. That's what all my portfolios have been printed on. It's the most consistent paper from box to box I've ever used. That's why I'm preferring it. And plus it has a very nice finish, which we'll get into when we get into the lab. You'll understand what matte paper is, what semi-gloss paper, what, what gloss paper is. And uh, you'll have to make a choice right off the bat. And, and finances will play a small role in this, not a big role because the price differential between an eight by 10 box of paper and 11 by 14 isn't that much, but it is something. So you can choose to make small eight by 10 prints, which are intimate. Here's the thing about small prints. If you go out and shoot a big scene and you print it on, make it on an eight by 10 piece of paper, that big scene is hard to see. So if you take that same picture of a big scene and you blow it up, 11 by 14, 16 by 20, 32 by 40, whatever the size is, as it incrementally gets larger, then more detail will be revealed to the viewer of your work. You follow me? So 11 by 14 for a lot of fine art photographers is customary. In the old days, yeah, you'd see five by seven prints, you'd see you know eight by 10 prints, uh, but in modern parlance, the way things have happened, photographers tend to print as large as possible. Um, so keep that, keep that in mind. Uh, for contact sheets, the class is required to use Ilford multi-grade RC paper. What that means, the RC means the paper is resin coated. Resin coated papers dry within a matter of minutes because of the, the um, there's not, it's not as fibrous, it's plastic actually. And the image lays more on the surface so it takes less time to dry. It's not an aesthetic paper. It's not what, if you go to the art museum, you're not gonna see anybody printing on RC paper. It's generally used for 
uh, quick prints, like, like if you're working in the lab, you're trying to decide on whether you want to print this to a final or it's made for contact sheets. So we're going to designate the RC paper uh, only for uh, contact printing. Note, a minimum of 100 sheets of paper is needed for the class. Consider finding a partner and splitting a 250 sheet box. The cost is about the same as buying a 100 sheet box. So I'm gonna have Dan jump in real, real quick right now and tell, tell you about availability of cameras and also about film and paper. Say hi to Dan. Oh, something happened. Okay, we'll continue. He'll, he'll jump back. Maybe he's having a bad connection. Uh, I have uh, a question before you move on. Um, is this oh, two, two different go types? Go ahead, Aaron. Is it two different types of paper or is this Ilford multigrade fiber in the RC format or, or is it two separate? No, no, actually it's the same company. Ilford, Ilford supplies both, but for your portfolio, for your finished work, we're gonna be using the fiber-based paper. That'll take longer to dry, it usually takes overnight. So we have uh, screens for that, which we'll show you how to use. After you make your print, you're gonna squeeze, wash it real good, squeeze it, and then lay it face down on the screens in the lab. And then the next day, you can come into the lab and retrieve them. RC, anything you print on RC, you'll be able to wash it, put it on the screen, and 10 minutes later, it'll be dry. So that, that's truly hey. the distinction. Okay, hi, Dan. Hey, sorry. Um, I'm on my phone right now, so it, my microphone wasn't working, but hello, everybody. Um, quick question, quick uh, thing to point out about the RC paper that uh, Professor Ward was talking about. We do provide that to you, so please do not go ahead and purchase that ahead of class. Okay, so that is provided by us. Um, but I do recommend maybe buddying up with a partner in class and purchasing the multigrade fiber paper that uh, Professor Ward is talking about. Um, as far as camera rentals go, if you are unable to get one, you don't have one, uh, you may not have the budget for it, please reach out to me. Um, we have a couple loaners available. I already have two that are going out, but um, I'll give you a brief instruction so you can at least get the idea because I believe in the next course, uh, Professor Ward is going to go over how the camera works, how we shoot with it, or that might even be today. Is that's, that right, Tony? That, that is today, Dan. <laughs> yeah, that, that's today. Okay, that's today. Yes. Um, excellent. So please reach out to me. I can uh, loan you a camera. If you don't have film yet, please reach out to me. We want you all to have the ability to shoot. Okay. Uh, am I missing anything, Tony? No, nope, that's it. That's it for, for now. I'm going to go into print finishing now. So choose from one of the method, methods below for mounting final print presentations. Option one, dry mounting. Okay, so when you make a fiber-based print class, what you're going to see in the lab is fiber-based paper tends to ripple like this when it's dry. So we have hot presses to flatten the prints. But artists to present a fiber-based print classically have a couple of different options to, to make sure that the print doesn't look objectionable when viewed. One is dry mounting. So we have a dry mount press here and we have paper for that. So I don't think there's a need to go out and buy paper, uh, paper for dry mounting at this time. The other method is, okay, so we use MT5 Beyond Fang Hunt 8x10 dry mount tissue and we use four ply archival mounting board if you get a 32 by 40 inch uh, board, which is, which is how they come, then you, well, I'll teach you how to cut it down so it accommodates your mounting. The other way to do it, which is more involved and a little bit more expensive, and it's the way that you see works of photography presented in galleries and museums, and that is the overmatting method. So imagine when you have your print gets laid down on a board like that, and then it's pressed. So it's nice and flat when it comes out of the press. The problem with this is now you have a finished print laying on a, a matte surface, okay? And you, if you lay another print on top of that in your portfolio case and another and another, and you're starting to shuffle your prints in and out of the case to show people what's gonna to happen to that print. 
going to get scratched. Surface is going to start to show Mars. That's why we use an overmat. So for overmatting, we use four ply archival mounting board. That's the same 32 by 40 inches. Uh, twice the amount will be needed for overmatting because we use the same material for mounting. Now, one of the cost of efficient methods that I use when I'm mounting and matting is that I'll, I'll mount my prints on two ply board, which is cheaper than four ply board. Your print is still going to lie flat on the board. Your overmount's going to keep pressure on it so it doesn't ripple. That's one thing that you can do. Uh, the other thing is you can go four ply and four ply, which a lot of artists do as well, but I'm trying to think of ways to save you money. Uh, reading materials. I think I sent out a notice on Friday um, to get a head start on reading Zarkowski's The Photographer's Eye, uh, namely Rosenblum's book, A World History of Photography. These two class, I've read hundreds and hundreds of books on photography, never came across these two. I've heard of them, but I never read The Photographer's Eye. Re I read it in preparation for the class and a lot of Zarkowski's writing overlaps how I teach, particularly how to frame a shot and how to compose a shot. Uh, so you'll, you know, you'll, today you'll pick up some of that language and you'll see it mirrored in Zarkowski's writings and uh, a photographer's eye. And the illustrations in the book are classic. I mean, a lot of famous photographers historically are represented in the, in the book. So it's a really good book to have. I found it on eBay for like 20 bucks when I got it. Same with Naomi Rosenblum. I bought it. It was like 35, very inexpensive. I did also reserve these textbooks at the reserve desk and also with our librarian. So however you decide you wanna soak in this knowledge is, is totally up to you. Um, Photography by London Stone and Upton. This is the main textbook that I'm gonna be using for the technical aspects related to photography and also the final exam. There's nothing gonna be on that exam from Zarkowski or, or uh, Rosenblum. So you need that textbook um for for the exam and also just to understand what i'm saying starting today i don't i know it's a little bit like i'm teaching you stuff before you read about it but you guys are smart you'll read it later and then you'll say oh yeah i know what he's talking about now so you'll get reinforcement if you haven't already started these textbooks uh so photography supplies and art supplies um they, they don't really overlap like for photography supplies, you've got webcam at 241 North 12th Street. Um, Dan pointed out to me, quick heads up, I know that the, because of level three and the COVID issues, you may not be able to leave campus. I'm totally aware of that now. So um, maybe they deliver or they could ship it to you, overnight it to you. However you, you get the... Um, your, your film is, is really up to you. Just don't break any of the rules, okay? Um, and let me know if you're stuck and I'll ask Dan to, to support you or you know, Ellie and uh, Cindy, our TAs for the class, will figure out some uh, ways for you to be uh, benefited under these unusual circumstances. Um, b &H, I always mention b &H because it's, uh, one, it's probably the largest distributor of photographic materials in the country, if not the world. I've been there many times over the years. Um, when you're able to travel again, it's, it would be fun just to walk in the B&H and just see all the different, like every, every camera manufacturer is represented. They got darkroom equipment, they got lighting equipment, they got a used department, they got film, like you, you just can't believe it. It's just an amazing, amazing place. Um, there's also a more local um, art supply house. Now those are the two, for uh, those are the two companies I'm mentioning for film supplies, okay? And by the way, uh, the owner of Webcam, John Webb is an old friend of mine. I've known him since he was like cutting his teeth under his father's tutelage back in the early eighties when I was getting my equipment and supplies from Webcam. So I, I like to throw them business because John now is the owner of the business. He's the sole proprietorship and he knows his stuff, man. He's really good and he loves working with students and he does discount to anyone in my class. So keep that also in mind. Okay, so the three um, art supplies, this is for if you uh, need to pick up any um, mat board. Now I, now I have been informed by the department that we have a lot of mat board in stock. If we should run out of stock, 
then these are supply houses you would need to get these materials for, and you won't need these until the end of the semester. Plaza Art, Blick, and Artists and Craftsmen, they're in different locales. Two are in town, one's in Chestnut Hill. They're all great, and they all have what you need in terms of finishing materials. Um, so that kind of covers that. Now, this is the next big important thing that you probably don't, don't have any knowledge of, but I'm gonna explain it now. So property rights and publishing. When a photographer takes a picture, whether you're in high school, college, or whatever, you own the copyright to the picture unless you're a minor, and then that copyright could be extended to your guardian, your parents, or whatever. But if you're 18 and older, anytime you make a picture by the US uh, Copyright Law of 1976, it was put into uh, legislation that photographers, when they make a photo, own the copyright. So what I'm explaining here is work produced in courses at the Lutnick Fine Arts Center is the property and copyright of the student. The most successful examples of student work will be published in the blog section of TonyWardStudio.com. Uh, I actually, my main website is TonyWard.com. I have a web portal. So I have a main domain, TonyWard.com, where you can peruse hundreds and hundreds of pictures I've produced over the decades I've been in this game. And then my subdomains are Tony Ward Studio and Tony Ward Erotica. I make separate domains depending on the content uh, so that I can steer the viewer in the direction where they need to go if they want to see a certain aspect of my work. So uh, generally, Tony Ward Studio is the home base for where I post all of the best work uh, from when I taught at Penn up until recently when I started teaching here at Haverford. So it's an amazing resource um, that I will um, use as time moves forward. So assignment descriptions and grading. Final grades will be based on the following. Workshops, which is really part of your class participation and attendance is 10% of your grade. Uh, assignment, the individual project, is 50%, uh, final exam is 10%. And again, that final exam is based on your readings from the uh, Stone book. Uh, you're gonna write a report, which I'll get to in detail in a minute, that's 10%. And the final portfolio presentation is 20. Uh, workshops, technical instruction, lab one will be negative development and contact printing. That will be in two weeks when we're back in, when we're actually in, in lab. Uh, lab two will be print development and lab three will be print finishing. So you'll have that last stretch of the course to really focus on working on, working on your final prints and learning how to make a proper presentation. So the note here is individual workshops with Dan Burns, our lab technician for the department can be arranged. His email is here. And that, that's in case if there's something you wanna go over that I'm gonna go over now that you need to finesse a little bit more when you have your cameras in hand, uh, you can Zoom meeting with Dan or you can, you can catch me, we can do a Zoom. So we're just trying to avail you to as much support as possible. We have Cindy G and Ellie Kearns uh, this semester as our TAs. Uh, Cindy was studied with me last year in my color class and she's a fine arts uh, major or minor? Major. Major. So she's no joke. I mean, she's in this, in this for the long haul and the work that she produced for my class was just simply outstanding. So I, uh, there's, there are times that they're gonna be available on Sundays. A lot of our students in this department work on Sundays uh, when they're not, we're not, not doing other activities and our, um, Cindy will be here from 12 to six and uh, Ellie will make herself available from 11, 10 to noon. So that's a lot of support right there. There's their emails. So now let's go over this first assignment. The first and only assignment. So before I read this, this is the zone I want you to get into as I read this. When you have a camera in hand, if you had your choice, what would you take a picture of? Now, when, you, when I ask you that, you also have to be realistic. You might say, hey, I'd like to go to Hawaii and shoot volcanoes. Well, that's not gonna be able to be done. So think of something that you'd like to take 
picture up realistically within the confines of level three, and we'll go from there. So there is no greater creative challenge than for the aspiring photographer to take on an individual project. It is representative of the ultimate freedom of expression, creativity, and is generally driven by intertwining the creative and social political agendas of the photographer producing the work. Some critics of fine art photography argue that the individual project is driven by a combined intellectual and visual passion that is all, very often identified as being the crowning achievement and essence of the photographer's ooh. Because of the schedule that we're under and the pressure we're under to, to get a lot done, I usually give the individual project on a full semester term. Like the color class is gonna get their individual project after they do two interim projects. So you're really jumping to the ideal project to work on in this class. And I, I, I hope you take advantage of it. Uh, pick a subject of passionate interest that inspires you in some unique way. Create a series of 20 pictures mounted on foam core. Oh, I'm sorry, 20 pictures with a cover sheet that includes one picture. Title of work and artist statement printed in the form of a PDF and mounted on foam core. So when I open up your portfolio case, I'm going to see one picture. It could be your favorite picture in the whole series of 20. And yes, you can repeat that picture out of the 20, or you can pick a 21st picture for your cover. And on that cover, you're going to have the title. That's the lead in. That gives the viewer a sense of what this portfolio is about. And then your artist statement will be telling the viewer why you uh, created this particular body of work. So the body of work will be considered as the final portfolio presentation for the class. Students are required to purchase a portfolio case to store the prints. Print size can range from eight by 10 inches to 11 by 14 inches. Mount size is required to be 16 by 20 inches for either print size. The portfolio, the portfolio case should be three inches thick and make sure it's three inches thick, I'll explain in a second. To accommodate mounting or over matting of prints, check in with Blick, Artist Craftsman, Supply, or B&H for a portfolio case option. So when you start searching for a portfolio case, you want a clamshell case, case that opens and lies flat on a table. Um, you just Google clamshell case and you'll see what I'm, I'm talking about. Or even when you peruse some of these uh, suppliers online, you'll see what I mean. They're, they come in black, they come in beige, they come in gray. So pick any color you want and uh, go for there. The reason why I select three inches is some of you may opt to overmat your prints, which is gonna add more thickness to each individual print. And I measured it from one of my portfolios at home. And three inches will easily accommodate uh, 20 prints that are over matted or mounted. References. Embarking on an individual project, photographers should obtain a fundamental understanding of the history of photography by reading Rosenblum's A World History of Photography and chapter 18 of London Stone Upton's textbook on photography. Here are a number of references to consider when deciding on which direction you would like to choose from with respect to subject matter. There are four genres of photography listed here. Other genres to consider include landscape, architecture, and fashion, which happens to be one of my specialties. So I've listed here under street photography, um, these actually have come down through the department through Professor Williams' uh, extensive uh, cataloging of the unit of the college's uh, incredible photography collection. So you can go through under, if you're interested in street photography, you've got uh, four classic names here. Henri Cartier-Bresson, who was the famous French photojournalist. Uh, Helen Levitt, who was a New Yorker, New York-based street photographer. Gary Winogrand was also a New York uh, based, but he also traveled all over the country making amazing street photographs. And Lee Friedlander, not, I don't quite remember where he's from, but he's in the canon. And when I say in the canon, these four are in the canon of photographic history. The modern version of photographic history 
was uh, initiated by the Gern, uh, the Gernsons and also um, Nancy Newhall and Beaumont Newhall. Those were the classic writers of photographic history. So if you were lucky enough when those books were written and started to pervade the photographic culture starting in the early 20s to let's say the mid 70s, if you were on the map, they would include you in the canon of photographic history. New histories, of course, now that we're in the 21st century will be written. Uh, Naomi Rosenblum came later, which was to her advantage because she got a chance to absorb all of the histories that had been written before her and encapsulated new research that she discovered, particularly with re reference to um, the Chinese uh, scientists that were involved early on with camera obscura and photographic history, uh, which is kind of sh short lived in those books written by um, the other authors I mentioned, the Gernsons and uh, Newhall. So under portrait photography, uh, we have Diane Arbus, amazing photographer. Uh, she also was in New York, uh, Annie Leibovitz, Richard Avedon, these are all very, very big names, and James Vanderzee. I think those are stellar names that will give you a variety of approaches to portrait photography. And um, yeah, that go, you might want to go for that. Uh, documentary photography, there of course is Walker Evans. Uh, we have an extensive collection of Walker Evans in our library, both original prints, books, um, that I can, you can access uh, through the college or you can you know, do a quick survey of him on uh, YouTube. This link that I found was a very good YouTube expose on him. Mary Ellen Mark was a Philadelphia girl. Actually, she grew up in my neighborhood in Elkins Park. She went to University of Penn, uh, got out of Penn and, and gravitated toward documentary and became one of the most famous documentary photographers of her generation. Uh, still life photography is another genre. I would look at Irving Penn, one of the giants of still life. Robert Maplethorpe wasn't really a still life photographer, but he did an amazing uh, body of work, as I recall, on floral arrangements. And Olivia Parker, one of my all time famous, she's not really, really super famous. You don't really read about her in the canons of photographic history but she's really damn good. I mean, what she does with still objects is just quite remarkable. See what you can find. Uh, this YouTube that I found on her wasn't that extensive, but I just wanted to you know, throw that name out there for you. So let's go over the final exam. So um, to, prepare for, to be prepared for the exam, you're gonna read London Stone and Upton, specific focus on chapters one through six and chapter 18. None of the other chapters are gonna be covered. Be sure to study the glossary of terms in the back of the textbook, that's very important. Uh, the type of exam that I issue is a no time limit. Average time takes about 35 minutes and the types of questions will be fill in the blanks, multiple choice, true or false. The test most importantly is divided into three sections. Main section, camera function, what we're gonna go over right now. Second section, processing, which is what you're gonna be learning about in lab and history of photography, which you want to absorb through your readings. Okay, so that's how that's going to be issued. And that's 10% of the final grade. Then you're going to write a report. Um, the, the Lutnick Art Center we have currently on display here in the, in the building, photographs from the college's fine art collection. Uh, these photographs will possess one of the categories as its dominant formal characteristic as defined in John Zarkowski's book, The Photographer's Eye, uh, which I mentioned earlier, is it a, really an amazing book. And we certainly see eye to eye in the way he describes how a photographer, a serious photographer approaches the medium. So he breaks it down into the thing itself, the detail, the frame, time, and vantage point. Those are all five important chapters that he writes about that will be enlightening to you for sure. It's a short read, it should only take about two hours to read, read the whole book from cover to cover because it's mainly a picture book. So as you're reading it, you'll start to absorb some of the things that he's writing about just by looking at the pictures. So in your five to six page double space report, select the photographer from the exhibit, which is on display here, 
and discuss the biography of the photographer, provide a description and name of the photographic process used in making the print, uh, start your report with the biography of the photographer, then explain how print quality, print materials, and print size affect your response to the image. Choose one of the five categories that best interprets the photograph and give your reasons for selecting it. The paper should conclude with how all of those components shape your response to the picture. Note, the research guide to photographic collections and resources provided by Anna Alexander Flagur uh, on the Lutnick Library webpage for photography should be consulted and used for researching your report. Uh, I know that she has um, visited our classes in the past, so she really loves photography and she's quite knowledgeable. So you can uh, hit her up with an email if you have a specific question. She, I'm sure she'll get right back to you. Uh, in most cases, information about the photographer or the photograph may be found in, uh, in Rosenblum's The World History of Photography or Naylor's Contemporary Photography. Those are both uh, here at the college on reserve. The master list of fine art photographs is also at the college or on the, or on the World Wide Web. Your research should, be, should include online sources as well, the photograph you use for the report. Okay, so the final portfolio. Uh, final portfolio contains 20 images produced for the individual project will be presented at the end of the course. The final portfolio must consist of a perfectly finished presentation. No unfinished work will be accepted. And all photographs must be mounted or over matted with archival presentation board. Uh, the portfolio must also contain an artist statement and cover sheet. So when you read the term archival, class. The reason for that is um, we want our photographs to last not days, weeks, months. We want them to, to last centuries. And the uh, chemistry that we use nowadays uh, does allow for that, especially if the photographs are protected in proper conditions and are away from anything that's acidic. So there, the, thus the term archival. Uh, any of the acidic acids, any kind of acid at all that gets onto your paper will eventually stain your print. And the reason why you, we use uh, archival board is because it's acid free. And early on, when you look at uh, old libraries of photographs that were mounted or matted, you pick up the mat and you can see a rim around the, where the mat was and you see a discoloration of the print because of the staining that was the transfer of the acid to the paper. So being, having an archival method of working is integral to a photographer's fine art work. So the course outline is pretty self-explanatory. I'm not gonna review all the points in the outline. You can uh, see that for yourself. Um, I'm gonna start uh, with the lecture today if there aren't any further questions before we begin. Anything off the top of mind that you'd like to ask? Okay, so let's get your notes out. Uh, you should have this checklist that I sent on Friday on the lesson plan. If someone doesn't have it, Cindy, shoot Cindy a note and she'll send it over to you. She has the checklist for today, the lesson plan class one. So I'd like to begin this lecture by asking the question, did you ever think about when photography was invented? Some may think it was the 19th century where a lot of the invention was made. Some perhaps will argue the 18th century, but some will argue like myself that photography was actually invented BC before Christ could have been invented by the Neanderthals. Now you might say, well, how could that possibly be? So here's how I illustrate. First of all, we're always working within a frame. The geometry of photography is a frame. It's a square frame or it's a rectangular frame. There's optical reasons and way cameras were manufactured confined us to this space. Now within this space, I'm gonna make a very simple drawing of how a caveman 
discovered photography. Okay, so this is sky. These are mountains. This is landscape. Cavemen, as we know, inhabited caves. Okay. So one day a caveman is in his cave. He goes out to get food in the landscape for his family. They started off perfectly fine. It was nice and clear. The sun was shining. It was a beautiful day. He ventured out to do some hunting and gathering. Lo and behold, as he picked up fish, whatever they were eating at the time, there maybe there was a, they, you know, the caves were usually near water, some type of water form, lakes or whatever. Heads back into the cave with the, today's eating for the family. Clouds start to appear. So he goes into the cave opening, starts to prepare a meal for the kids. Then an act of nature occurred. Unfortunate act of nature. There was thunder and lightning. There was shaking of the ground. And they were huddled in this cave that only had one way in and one way out. Unfortunately for this family, because of the earthquake that transpired, the opening of the cave collapsed, leaving just a small ray of light to show where the opening of the cave once was. Needless to say, they're panicked. Very little light coming in from that opening. But then the miraculous act of science and nature collided with the foundation of photography. Why? Because he stepped into, or now was in what we refer to as the darkened chamber. And an act of physics introduced him to what we would later, centuries and centuries later, would reveal as the, the fundamental nature of photography. And that's the invention of the camera obscura. This is a term that's been mentioned for thousands of years through science. Excuse me. So in a camera obscura or a darkened chamber, what happened was he sees the hole from inside the cave and he gets disoriented. So he turns around like this and faces the back of the cave. And can someone tell me what he saw from this collapsed entrance? The outside upside down. Correct. What he saw was the outside of the cave, the landscape, upside down and inverted backwards on that back wall. That is the invention of photography via physics and the camera obscura. So let's jump forward to a darkened chamber made out of the shoebox. Okay. Everyone has probably heard of, whether you've taken photography class or not, of the invention of the pinhole camera, which is essentially the darkened chamber. And in early photography, once they figured out the nature of the physics of, of photography, they made simple devices to capture an image upside down and backwards first so that they could draw from it, i.e. the 
camera lucida where they installed a mirror in the darkened chamber and were able to invert the image so that the artist could draw on it or as i originally explained the camera obscura where the artist is inside of the darkened chamber that's the illustration that i had sent you so if you put in a, a photosensitive piece of paper inside of a shoe box close the box and put a pinhole in it and put a piece of paper over that hole you've made a camera and this is literally how they started making the earliest cameras they didn't have lenses they just had a hole and they just had a piece of whatever over over the surface of the hole which is the aperture where they could capture the light and then ultimately over a period of time through a time exposure they would see what was viewed outside of the darkened chamber upside down and backwards this is the fundamental understanding of the evolution of photography uh, i also in, the, in one of the other handouts gave you a written typed out description of camera obscura so you understand that history and again as as time uh, evolved full throttle into the 19th century photographers started to figure out ways to make images permanent because it, for, for many many centuries whether they were using a, a, a camera lucida or a camera obscura or root camera they couldn't affix anything they could see an image was there but it took many many centuries to figure out how to make that permanent so there's a key date in photographic history when a french scientist by the name of louis daguerre invented a type of photograph called a daguerreotype this is a type of photograph that you're going to read about in the history where in fact daguerre was able to uh, invent a methodology in which he could make an image permanent. So that's why this year is so important in photographic history. 1839. Every book that you ever read about photographic history will meet, will mention that date because that's the year that, the, that Louis Daguerre got his patent. Now, now keep in mind there were other scientists uh, daguerre was french he was he was from paris there was also albert nips was who was also french um, there was william henry fox talbot who was a british scientist so the scientists invented photography uh, through through working with light sensitive chemicals uh, the main one that we'll be using in this class is called silver ally Silver halide is laid on an emulsion, which is your film strip, evenly at a, at a factory. And that, that chemical, when it's exposed to light, starts to get big. It forms a crystal, a grain, what we refer to in analog photography as grain. And as that grain gets more and more and more light, and as there's more of the silver highlight present on the film itself, when it's exposed to more light, it starts to get bigger and bigger. This is the difference between 100 ASA black and white film and 400 ASA, is that the grain gets bigger because it's more light sensitive. There's more highlight on the emulsion. Follow? Okay, so these are some of the, you know, rudimentary ideas I want you to keep in mind as we proceed now. So, fast forward to 1895. So the 18, the 19th century was the most incredible inventive period for photographic history in terms of the technical nature of the medium, making an image permanent, developing lenses, developing cameras, developing shutter speeds, understanding ASA and ISO. And then in 1895, 
the camera was invented by this company in Rochester, New York, which I happen to have here. A friend of mine gave me one. These were mass produced. These were amongst the first mass produced cameras available to folks between 1895 to 1905. Uh, it's obviously a darkened chamber and it's collapsible, meaning that they had a strap here so you could walk around with it like so with, with a strap and go to your, wherever you're photographing with a nice compact camera. But the incredible inventiveness of the design enables you to open the box, open the chamber, and you can pull out the lens like so. It just came off the track because it's old and it really doesn't work. And then you can see where the lens is and where the film would go. So once they got to this point, Photography just exploded all over the world because everyone wanted to learn how to use this rudimentary device. So now we're going to go into a more modern version of the evolution of the camera obscura. I'm going to start with the medium format cameras first. Um, this is called a Hasselblad. Uh, this is the the, the camera that the astronauts actually took when they went to the moon. Uh, it's a Swiss made camera. It was my workhorse two and a quarter camera for decades. And it's still in beautiful operating condition. In fact, I took it to uh, one of the local supply houses uh, just to have him you know, check something out for me. He wanted to buy it from me. He was like, you know, he was like, so he, yeah, cause you, you know, he just was impressed with it because it had this finder. Um, this is called a sports finder. Most Hasselblads you do like this, but I got this special finder because I, was, I like to shoot this way instead of looking down through the viewfinder and it, it actually comes off. So the way it's designed is you have film back that comes off. And when I was shooting a lot of two and a quarter, and I had this, like assistants coming through my studio, I would hand him one of these backs and see how quickly he or she could load it. Because believe it or not, it's not the, the easiest thing to load, but after you get, get it down, you can load it pretty quickly. And if you're shooting a, um, a portrait or working on something where you need the film backs right away, I need an assistant that could load the film very quickly. So this is the slide that you pull out when you're ready to make an exposure. Film would be right here. And after it's loaded, you would put it, you know, back on the back. And this is the uh, sports finder and that comes off too. Well, I don't want to force it off and I don't need to take it off, but trust me, it does come off. So that's interchangeable. And then this of course is where the lens goes. This is called a bayonet mount. So the lenses on these are interchangeable. And this is called a bellows extension. The reason why you see a bellows designed this way, unlike the Poco camera, is the bellows extension in this case is used to prevent light from extraneously falling on the lens while you're shooting. Because if you don't use a bellows extension and you're in the wrong lighting situation, you can pick up like what's happening in Eric's room where you get a lot of flare, right? From backlight or side light or whatever. So we would use what these, this is also referred to as a compendium because it extends out depending on the lens that you're using. And the, the main reason why we use two and a quarter is because the negative is two and a quarter by two and a quarter inches and therefore yields a much more uh, sharper, refined image. So the smaller the negative, the less detail, the bigger the negative, the more detail. So that's something rudimentary that I, I, I think you should know. The other advantage of the Hasselblad camera is that, is that the shutter and the f-stops are on the lens, whereas a, a 35 millimeter camera, the shutter is on the body. Now, because of this design, and I'll get into this more in detail, 
Um, this is called a leaf shutter. 35 millimeter cameras are called a focal plane shutter. And the difference between a leaf shutter and a focal plane shutter is that a leaf shutter will sink at any speed. Therefore, if you're using flash equipment, which requires a certain shutter speed, usually a 60th of a second and up, then a leaf shutter comes in handy because you can sink at any speed and you can do high speed photography as a result. So that, this is a really an amazing camera. Uh, I have it with an 80 millimeter lens, which is considered normal for two and a quarter. And it also, I also use a 50 millimeter lens for two and a quarter, which is considered a wide angle lens and a 150 millimeter lens, which is best used for portraiture. The wider the lens, the more distortion. So you have to learn how to control distortion when you're uh, creating portraits, for example. Now we'll get into the meat of what most, if not all of you will be using today. And that's the 35 millimeter camera. Now you'll notice that I have two identical cameras. I use the Nikon F3s. I've had these for decades. They are professional cameras. They rarely break and I still use them. Uh, the, the reason why I, ha I have two is if you're on a shoot and one of the cameras malfunctions, jams, you're in the middle of a shoot, then I would, I would go to my backup. Um, the other reason why I always had two is some shoots I would shoot color in one camera, black and white in the other in case I needed, I was mixing mediums. Um, but most importantly, it's always good to have a backup if you're a pro in case something goes wrong because you're getting paid to do a job. And if you can't do the job, you're not going to get paid, nor do you get called back for more work. So that's a hard lesson to learn if you're a pro. So the first thing I'll go over is the body. Now, the way these, the bodies work is this is called a bayonet mount, right? So I took the, the cover cap off of, of the uh, lens mount. And if the first thing you'll see, let me get closer. is the mirror inside. See that little mirror, it's on a 45 degree angle. That was generated from the invention of the camera Lucida. When you hold that 45 degree mirror in front of the lens, the light comes in, bounces off that mirror, goes up into a prism that enables you to view without uh, having the image be like the cavemen were seeing it, upside down and inverted. So this is the invention that they created to make you be able to see your pictures right side up and properly from left to right. That's what the prism is for. Now with some advanced cameras like this camera, um, there, are, there are actually interchangeable prisms. There are all kinds of prisms for different types of photography. No need to explore that now because none of you probably will be using a camera uh, with interchangeable prisms. Prisms, but one of the advantages is inside the um, the prism are your focusing is your focusing glass. So some photographers like different types of focusing glasses, like some are split level finder, some are just focusing with the ring from your hand. You'll be reading about that in the in the technical uh, manual, the stone book. But that's the reason why they're interchangeable. Also on a 35 millimeter body, you have a ring, this ring right here. This is where you control your shutter speeds. And if you notice on this camera, there's like a red mark on one of these numbers. And that's at a, usually on most cameras, you're gonna see a color distinction at a 60th of a second. The reason for that is class, is that when you're hand holding a 35 millimeter camera, most folks, get camera shake when they're shooting with a shutter speed that's under a 60th. So they put your little red warning there for you. Generally what I teach my students to do is if they're shooting indoors, low light, and they need that slower shutter speed to capture more light uh, on that part of the um, exposure, that's when I tell them to jump over to a, a tripod. 
Okay, so that's what this string does. Here's your film winder in advance, right here to advance the film. This is where you turn the meter on. Usually most cameras, you just push your shutter button halfway down to en engage your meter. Usually there's a switch on your camera too to turn your meter on so you don't wear the batteries out. And with my Nikon, the switch to turn it on is right here. And I know it's on because I get a little red indicator when I turn the, the little latch to the right. So first thing you do is decide what ISO you want. So with this camera on the film dial, the, the, uh, where you, you load your film, there's a little latch where you can make your ASA adjustments, 400, 800, whatever it is. That's usually on the left with 35 millimeter cameras right here. So, and this is the take up side. So this is the loading side, this is the take up side. So I'll open the back so you can see, there's no film in here. So for me to open this camera, I have to pull my lever up like so. This is the winder switch. And then I pull up on the, its cap and there's another little device that I have to turn to the left so you don't accidentally open it back. So it's a little bit complicated. Every camera is slightly different, but I have to do two functions in once and then the back opens up like so. When you have your, when you have your film back open, always visually check to make sure there's no debris or dust or any extraneous broken off film. Sometimes film will break off when you're unwinding it in the housing here, because sometimes that can get caught up in your shutter, which is right here, and it can jam your camera. So make sure when you open your camera back, it's clean of any debris whatsoever. And I can just show you how this shutter works by going to a slower speed. You can see when it, when I click the shutter, the focal plane goes up. Actually, I'm sorry, the focal plane goes over, lets the light hit the back of the film, and then it closes automatically. This is called a focal plane shutter. As I said, with two and a quarter cameras, there's no setup like this with the Hasselblad. The shutter is actually part of the lens. There's advantages and disadvantages to each. Because this is a focal plane shutter, when I engage the shutter to make a picture, it takes a certain amount of time for that shutter to go across to get out of the way so the light comes in at a certain rate. And if you're out of sync, if you're using flash, for example, and you're not, uh, at, at a 60th of a second, which is the flash sync that I'll be going over shortly, then you can actually get a picture of, of the focal plane, which will be on every single frame. So it's a little bit tricky, but that's the way it's designed. So the film gets loaded on this side, it's pulled over, goes under this leaf. I think I have a roll of film now, hold on. Okay, so the way I load my camera. So again, every camera is a little bit different, but usually uh, with most cameras, you'll have to pull up on your, on your winding knob to get this little clip out of the way, like so. And then you slip the film into the film canister into the left side of the body, close it, and then feed the spool into the take up by hand like that. Now there are some cameras that have auto loading. Your camera may have auto loading, meaning all you'll have to do is go to this point and then you close the back and it'll do the rest of the work itself automatically. My camera isn't designed that way. So once I get the film uh, installed in the spool on the right, I'll click my shutter advance it, advance it again. Close the back and then I wind the film taut. So it's 
So the film is laying very tightly against the, the um, pressure plate. The pressure plate holds the film flat so that you don't get any distortion when you're shooting. Then I close the clip on the left side, make sure again it's nice and taut. Then I advance it to frame one. Okay, and now conversely, to unload the film, there's a knob on this camera to disengage it from the right side take up reel just by turning this switch, pushing the motor drive. And it, it's uh, it just jammed. So I'm not gonna be able to do that, but that's, you'll, you'll figure out every camera is a little bit different and I'll figure out the jam late, uh, later. The reason why I use a motor drive on the bottom like this actually comes off. And this is what most cameras look like, a plain 35 millimeter body. I use the motor drives because if I'm shooting fashion and the model's moving and I wanna do a lot of shots right away, I don't have to, I don't have to crank it the advance myself bit by hand. Does everyone kind of understand those rudiments? Okay, so while we're still working on the body, now we're gonna go over two crucial things that relate to your 35 millimeter body. That is ASA and shutter speed. So on the body, you have to set ASA and deal with shutter speed. A question, Tony? Yeah. Um, when the, the ASA, ISO is part of the film, do, does that mean all the, the, I, the ISO knob on the camera is doing is adjusting the light meter? Or is it doing something to the so watch? What, what, what you're doing when you're adjusting your ISO is setting it to read your exposure at the designated ISO of the film. So let's go over ISO and what this means. Some cameras, like on this camera, I can set my ISO to as high as 6,400, so I'm gonna go this way. 6,400 is the highest ISO that my Nikon will accept, okay? The lowest ISO on this end is 50, actually it's less, it's 25. So 25 ISO means that you have less rain and it takes more light to arrive at a proper exposure that you can print, right? So, and then you have all these increments in between. You have 50, 100, 200, 400, 800, 1200, 2400, 4800. So, yeah, I missed. I missed something here. So let's just take these. And, and, and the, the reason why I'm making, writing these down is that these are increments factors of two. So if I go from 25 to 50, that means I'm letting in approximately twice as much light at, at 50 than I am at 25. If I, if I let in, if I go from 25 to 100, two times more and so forth and so on. So these are all based on factors of two. If you get up to these higher ends of the scale, you're gonna be getting very grainy pictures, but that also depends on which film you choose. So when you buy your film, let's say you decide you wanna do your individual project with that grainy look, that's an aesthetic decision that you're gonna make. And by the way, I created thousands of prints rating my film at 12,800 that I became known for because it was very unique at the time. 
And there was a film that was made called P3200 by Eastman Kodak was the normal rating for the film. What made it unique was when you rated P3200 at the, at the designated manufacturer setting and, and uh, processed it according to their recommendations, you would get a very one beautiful grain. It wouldn't be as grainy as some other films. So you have to do a little bit of research when you buy film over the long haul to determine where you want to lock in with ISO and ASA. So that, when you're camera body, that's decision number one, okay? Decision number two is shutter speed. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to go over was ISO and ASA and how that, what was the evolution of that? So I, ISO means international standard organization. That's what ISO means. ASA means American. Standard organization. So in, in the 19th century, there were competing companies that were starting to evolve in Europe and in America, Kodak being the one here that was starting to take hold in our country, that came up with a standard methodology on the way they manufactured film so that whenever you went from any state, from one state to another, and you went to a store to buy film, they created a standard that when you ordered or bought 100 ASA, it would be 100 ASA. It wouldn't be 400 ASA or 8. It wasn't random. It was scientific. It was empirical. So these became the international standards by which we know ISO and ASA today, okay? So first thing when you're working on your individual project, how do I want my pictures to look? What do I, what speed do I want to use to create my photographs? That's a personal choice and a, and a personal decision. Does that answer that question? Well, I, I was just, I was wondering, like, because the, the, the ISO is determined by the film you're putting in, right? Like, so all that is changing when you change the ISO setting on the camera itself is how it's metering and not how it's that's, actually. That's, that's one of the factors that's part of the metering. But I, yeah. always, I always teach my students to start with the ISO because once you set the ISO, to create a cohesive body of work, you have to stay there because prints look differently depending on that ISO selection. So that's how I want to train you. Think ISO first. Look at the, the history books. Look at, you know, start to get a feel for a grainy picture compared to one that's not so grainy. And then you'll lock that in. Then the next thing you, you want to deal with on the body is shutter speed. So let's just use for the sake of argument, we're setting up the shoot and we're going to rate our film at 100 ISO. So that's our good first, first setting on your manual camera. Next thing you've got to start thinking about is where I'm shooting and what am I shooting. So on your camera, there is that dial that I talked about where you can set different shutter speeds. Now we're working with we're working, I'm teaching you in the manual mode class. There are some 35 millimeter cameras that have automatic functionality, meaning you select your ISO and then it picks, and then when you start to meter for a shot, it will select your shutter speed or your aperture for you. Or some cameras will just, are priorities, uh, you can prioritize that will select the F number and then randomly select shutter speed. But to learn photography, it's best to control all of those 
three controllable factors, three controllable factors, and that think that's leading to your uh, question uh, regarding ISO is factor one, ISO, factor two, shutter speed, And factor three, AS, I'm sorry, F stop. Now in the nor in the nomenclature of photography, when we talk about F stop, we're talking about how much light we're letting into the lens, right? Does anyone know any of the other terms for F stop? Yeah. Aperture. Correct. There's two more. Anyone else? Iris. And the fourth diaphragm. So these four terminologies, f-stop, aperture, iris, and diaphragm are used interchangeably when people talk about photography. The, the most common one that people use nowadays is f-stop. So once you start to control these three uh, controllable factors to make, what is the goal? The goal is to make what I refer to as a median exposure. That's the goal. Without controlling these three factors, you have no control of the camera. You have no control of the picture. You're, you're, you have no control of anything. You, what you will wind up getting is overexposure or underexposure. If, for example, I'm using a 100 ISO to start with, and my camera's meter meters uh, an f-stop, stop, not the camera's meter, the shutter speed I select is the 60th. All right, so I've got, I know I can't go below a 60th. I'm indoors, but I'm using slow speed film. If for some reason, when I press down, once you have these two factors selected, most of these manual cameras that you use nowadays, then the camera meter will tell you what the f-stop is. So the f-stop may be once I have ISO of 100, I know I want to work at a 60th shutter speed, then it may say when I take my reading that your f-stop is f2. So that's how the three controllable factors work together. Now you can go over or under depending on how much contrast you want in your negative and the look you want in your prints. And this is something that when you practice and you get to learn your meter, um, how that will all play out. So like when I go to take a reading after I selected ISO and I know I want to be at a, a 60th of a second, my meter looks like this when I click halfway down on the shutter and my meter's on my camera. There'll be a minus over here and there'll be a plus over here. And the median exposure will be in the middle of these two. Now, if you selected 100 shutter speed at 60, and that meter is pointing to the positive or is steady in the positive, that means you're overexposing. So that means you've got to make an adjustment. You either got to, okay, if you're at F2, if you're overexposed, then what would I do? Then you, then you use the term stop down. This is when you start working with those controllable factors. Stop down means less light coming in because I'm letting too much light in. Do you understand that fundamental or do you want me to go over it again? Okay. So back to f-stops. 
F-stops are in factors of two as well. On this camera, this camera will go from eight seconds to four seconds, two seconds to one second, half second, and so forth and so on, right? All the way down to one two thousandths of a second. That's really a fast shutter. At a two thousandth of a second, you're not going to get, you can shoot like cars, stop the action of trains, stop the action of someone running. So as you go up the scale with your shutter speed, will factor into the type of picture you're making. If it's an action shot, you want to use a faster shutter. Or if you like the aesthetic of motion and you have someone running, then you want to play down into slower shutter speeds. Follow? Questions about shutter? Okay. Now we're going to go over lenses and how lenses relate to ISO and shutter. Shutter and ISO, again, are, are based on camera function. Lenses are independent. So the way I always store my lenses, I keep a lens cap and a um, rear lens cap in place so as to prevent any dust or dirt getting on the lens elements. When you're looking at your lens, if there's a little bit of dust on the front lens element, really won't be that big a factor. You can just use a, a, at the photo supply houses, they have lens cloths that you can buy really inexpensively to clean your lens. But what you really got to look out for is this rear lens element. The reason why this is problematic is if you think about it, the rear lens element is closest to your film plane. So any lens that's closest to the film plane is going to make the image sharper and sharper and sharper, further away, more diffuse. So if you have a piece of cat hair, for example, or a little piece of hair on that rear lens element, you might start seeing it on your film. So make sure your rear lens element is always kept super, super clean and front lens el element clean as well, but rear lens element uh, extra important. So this first lens that I'm showing you is a called 20 millimeter lens. The 20 millimeter lens is considered wide angle. It's a wide angle lens. So wide angle means wider field of view from left to right, top to bottom. So here are a couple of customary things with wide angle lenses. First of all, Wide angle lenses have more inherent depth of field. More inherent depth of field, meaning when I put this lens on my body, I get more sharpness from the foreground of the picture to the background of the picture just by virtue of using a wide angle lens. So if you want to, if you decide to do a series of pictures, you want everything sharp, wide angle lens is ideal. Not so much uh, for portraiture because the wider the angle of the lens, the more chance you pick up lens distortion. So this is the 20 millimeter lens. Now, the other thing about lenses, um, that's, that's a crucial factor is lens speed. Most photographers, when they buy a lens, want to go out and get the fastest lens they can get. Why? Because the faster the lens, the more light it captures, the more useful that lens is in low light situations. So lens speed value goes up. So 
So how do I know if I have a fast or slow lens? Both could have good glass. Both could be render the same quality image, but but f-stop factors into everything with speed. So for example, these are the classic F numbers that are most important for you to know and be familiar with. Starting at 1.4, very fast, very fast lens, oftentimes expensive, depending on the size of the uh, focal length. F2, also very fast lens, not it's one stop, this is considered one stop. So every F number is one stop. By right? it's just also a factor of two. Shutter speed's a factor of two, ISO is a factor of two, and F numbers are a factor of two. So all of those three controllable factors are variable, but when you make an adjustment on one, you have to make a converse adjustment on the other. So if you want more shutter speed, then you've got to stop down more. If you want less shutter speed, then you've got to open up more. ISO will always stay the same. Then you have 2.8, 3.5, 4, 5.6, 8, 11, 16, 22, 32, 45, 64, 90. These are the classic F numbers. So as we go from here to there, lens is like this. So the opening of the lens for F 1.4 is very big. When you get all the way down to here, F number is very small. So that, that should give you a visual ideation of how F numbers work. So as you go down in this number, as, as numbers get bigger, it's, it's, out, it's kind of counterintuitive. You think, oh, bigger number, bigger F opening. It's just the opposite. So, but as you go, as you go up the numbers, then what happens is you also get more depth of field. Right, so you get more sharpness in the foreground of your uh, foreground of your landscape, all the way to your horizon line. More depth of field. So there's two things that that, that uh, compensate for depth of field: lens and f number. Shutter speed has nothing to do with depth of field. ISO has nothing to do with depth of field. Only thing that has anything to do with depth of field is your f number and the lens selection. Remember that because a lot of times uh, students will go out and make pictures and they come back soft because they didn't stop down enough. And then, of course, there's other issues with regards to how you focus using your, uh, your the glass, you know, the um, focusing ring in your, in your body. But so the more depth of field you have, the better chances are that your, your film is going to be sharp at least. So that's the 20. These are all the workhorses of a professional photographer. The next lens I'd like to show you is a really cool lens. This lens is based off the design of the 4x5 camera. So the way the 4x5 camera is designed, unlike the two and a quarter or the 35 millimeter camera is that this camera not only produces a bigger ne negative, which gives you more sharpness, it also has swings and tilts on it, meaning that you can move the film plane independent of the lens plane. You could you can angle the, you can correct perspective because everything is moving like this between lens plane, lens plane and film plane. When you have that mobility, you have more control. So camera manufacturers designed this 28 PC lens, which is a 35 millimeter lens, but it has this little knob on the bottom here 
And when I rack it, you'll notice that the lens actually goes up. See that? So if I'm shooting a building, let's say you're in Center City, So you're in Center City and you're on Broad Street and you're here. City Hall is here. You're using a 35 millimeter camera. So to get the top of this building and to keep the camera level, you're going to crop part of the top of Billy Penn's hat off, right? Everybody, everybody has, has done that. When they go to take a picture of a building, what do you do? Go like this, right? Now, what does that create? There's a, there's a term in photography that happens when your 35 millimeter camera goes out of level when you're tilting a camera up. Does anyone know what it is? It's called the Keystone Effect. Keystone Effect which means that when I angle the camera up, the building's line, lines start to converge like that. You've all seen that, you've all experienced that. That's the keystone effect. The keystone effect can be avoided when you're using a view camera because the front lens element moves up and the film plane stays the same. So a film plane stays the same, camera lens moves up, the camera obscura is still functioning, it's just ang more angular. The light comes in on a different angle, which minimizes the keystone effect. This is the main reason why professional photographers use a view camera when they're hired to do architectural work, because architects like their buildings to be viewed the way we see them in reality. Our brain makes the keystone effect adjustment, whereas cameras don't. Because on a 35 millimeter camera, you can plainly see now. I put this lens on here. If I start tilting the camera up, Lens and film plane are parallel, okay? So keep that in mind when you're shooting buildings. Now, one way to get around that is the further back you go, less keystoning, right? Less keystoning the further back you go. Longer lens that you use. When you start using a telephoto lens, you want to have to pull back. You're going to get less keystoning. So this invention of the PC controlled lens, 20, this is called a 28 PC. It was the lens that I bought years ago when I was shooting a lot of architectural photography. I had my four by five camera, but the client didn't need a big enlargement. The client was making a little brochure, didn't need a big negative, wasn't gonna be, wasn't gonna use all that uh, sharpness. They, you know, 35 millimeter film was sharp enough. So I got this. Here's the drawback. You've already learned from what I indicated about fast and slow lenses. This 20 millimeter lens is a 3.5. So when you go to a camera store, camera guy will say, oh, look, you know, you want a fast or slow lens, means, which means in, in terms of money, do you want to spend a little more for a faster lens? 3.5 is pretty slow, but the trade-off is a wider angle lens. So the super wide angle lens, they, 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 they're not designed for the faster speeds. The faster speeds can be ascertained as you go up the, up the uh, chain in terms of lens selection. 28 PC, the same thing. It's a 3.5, it's slow, but I learned, you know, you work around that when you're using the advantage of the PC control. The real now, now we're getting into what we call normal lenses. First two, 20 and 28, they're wide angle lenses. 
The next one in my toolkit is the 35 millimeter lens. This is a lens that's a little bit closer to your actual field of vision, okay? It's wide, but it's also normal. It's not a super wide, it's not 20, it's not 28. It's, it's almost like a normal lens, but they consider it a wide angle. The advantage of a 35 is you can get it at 1.4. So this is considered a fast lens, 1.4. Then you get into what is actually considered to be a normal lens, which is more than likely gonna be what you guys have on your cameras when you get them. Normal lenses are 50 or 55 millimeters. That's considered normal. You can use it for scenes, you can use it for just about anything. It can accommodate almost any kind of situation depending on distance from camera to subject. The advantage that I have when I use a normal lens is I'll pay a little extra and get what we refer to as a, a 55 macro lens. Macro means you can focus much closer to your subject. So in other words, you can, you, when you put this on, rather than having a, a focusing limit of let's say three feet, if you get any closer than three feet with a normal 50 millimeter lens, you can't make it sharp. You have to pull back, right? So you can't take a macro shot. You can't take a detail because the lens is at its limit. So what I did is I bought a macro lens, which allows you to focus macro photography. You can shoot bugs, you can shoot bolts, you can shoot jewelry, whatever, anything close. If you want to do a whole series on watches, you can get the face of the watch with a macro lens where you couldn't with a normal lens. So that's the, that's the beauty of having uh, the macro capacity on the 50 plus. Then uh, after that, I have an 80 millimeter lens in my kit. This is considered a portrait lens. The reason why it's considered a portrait lens is because it has minimal, dis minimal distortion and it's great for portrait photography because you have to be a little bit further from the subject because of its limited focusing capacity at short distances, which forces you into keeping the subject non-distorted. So great lens for portraiture is the 85. And then besides that, I use a 105. Now the, this particular 105 comes with a lens hood. So some lenses, especially when they start getting long, this really isn't considered a telephoto. It's considered a portrait lens really because of its uh, lack of distortion. And the problem with it is that the front lens element is very close to the bezel of the lens. And when you have a lens that's designed this way where it's so close to the edge of the way the lens is built, easy to get flare from light sources coming in from the sides or whatever. So they built in a lens hood that just slides right off of the uh, bo a body of the lens to uh, prevent that from happening. So that's a good feature. Now you can get hoods for virtually any camera as an auxiliary element. Uh, I would recommend you just be careful if you can't afford to buy you know, a lens hood or whatever but I thought I'd point out that feature to you. This is also a uh, 2.5 lens. So this is relatively fast compared to a 3.5, which is at least a stop slower. And then the last lens in my arsenal is the 150. Uh, 150 millimeter lens. This one happens to be, I'm sorry, it's a 180 millimeter lens. And this is a fast one, this is 2.8. So I spent more money for this lens because you can get a lot of telephoto lenses that are starting at 3.5. But that extra, show, that extra lens speed is a big asset when you're shooting in low light conditions like I mentioned earlier. And you're gonna have to be further back from the subject uh, with these telephoto lenses, but they have, all lenses have a certain look to them that plays into your photographic style. There are photographers that only work with telephoto lenses. There are photographers that only work with normal lenses. 
There are photographers that work only with wide angle lenses because over the body of work that they're creating, they want to maintain a certain look and consistency when they present their work. Do you, you, you follow me on that? Okay, let's talk about camera shape for a second. So again, to, to review on your camera body, there's a dial for shutters that usually has an indicator at a 60th of a second. So this is what we need when we have our lighting demo. This is what we need to know about that indicator. So when you're shooting at a 60th of a second, most folks can hand hold at a 60th of a second. Underneath that, 30th, 15th, 8th, quarter, half, these are impossible shutter speeds to hold the camera steady with. So this is when you would switch off to using a tripod. It's also the key flash sync shutter speed when you're using an auxiliary flash, like an external flash. Flashes sync at a 60th of a second. Some flashes will sync at any speed, depending on whether you're using a focal plane shutter, which is what these are, or a leaf shutter, which is what we I explained to you was used for the Hasselblad. So you have that advantage depending on the format, depending on the type of camera. Even the view camera has to be shuttered. So that can be also used for flash. Now let's get into metering and bracketing. So like, I, so the goal of exposure is to arrive at a median exposure. And like I pointed out in my camera, I have minus, which represents underexposure, plus, which represents overexposure. If I get a reading right in the middle, then that's a median exposure. That's where I would shoot my first frame. Let's say that median exposure is at F8. In the beginning, when you're learning this craft, it would be wise to do a bracket. So a bracket is the term we use when we're out in the field and we want to ensure that we've got something to take back to the lab to process so that the film is not overexposed or underexposed. So I'm going to show you what the five step bracket would be. So if I get a median exposure according to my light meter as the correct measure, then I want to go to eight and a half, which is a half stop increment. Some lenses actually have click stops that you'll hear when you go between 8 and 11 or 11 and 16. Other lenses you just kind of get a feel for. You have to physically look at the lens and try to find a mark between 8 and 11 on your, on your lens style. So a bracket would be 5, 8 and a half, and 11. And then on the other way, I would go 5.6 and a half and 5.6. This is called a one, two, three, four, five step bracket with my median exposure from my meter at F8. So let's think about theoretically what this does. So what this does is it starts to manipulate the contrast of your negative. Under exposure on film, on negative film means you have less silver alloy. That means the dark parts of the picture are going to go black. There won't be any detail. Like if you're shooting a landscape and part of the leaves are creating shade underneath the branches of the tree, 
and it's very shadowy and dark, but you see it with your eye, right? You see it, it's there. There's detail in the shadows. If you are underexposed, you're going to lose all of that. So here's the thing I want you to know. It's better to be overexposed than underexposed. Because if you're overexposed, class, that means that the uh, exposure is there. It's just that the halide is so built up that you may not be able to penetrate it with the light in the dark room unless you create more exposure when you're printing. But at least it's there. This is where we get into the theory of dodging and burning prints. Burning a print means you have a slight overexposure in your film uh, exposure and development, but it can be compensated for in the lab by burning down that overexposure. And also what, what could happen is while you're creating that overexposure, some of your dark areas will also be too dark. So you can dodge those areas in the lab. Dodge means with your hand or with the tool, you don't expose that part of the negative to the same amount of light that you're gonna expose the rest of the negative. And you'll, you'll be more familiar with this when we get in the lab. But the main point here of exposure that I wanna, uh, want you to leave with today is it's better to be overexposed than underexposed and it's better initially when you're first learning how to use your camera for your main assignment to do some five-step brackets, write those bracket numbers down in the notebook, process your film, and then when we analyze your negative film on a light table, we'll be able to say, you know, I think you're, you know, you're slightly under, your meter's a little bit off, so it might be better that you use this F number in that kind of situation. If you, you kind of get that? So that's kind of how that works. Tony, why do we bracket with um, aperture and not with shutter speed? That's a great question. The main reason is, well, you answer it. Now let's ask the question, why do we bracket with F number rather than shutter speed? What is the distinct difference between those controllable factors that the other doesn't have? With respect to that. I mean, the, the thing that jumps out to me is, you know, if you're shooting at like one hundredth of a second, you can't reasonably go down a whole step because then you might get blur. Um, but I'm not convinced by that answer. Well, here is the here's the reason why. You have more depth of field control. It's that simple. That's why that's why we bracket with the F number. It's because if, if you're using a long lens and your focus is slightly off and you use your, your bracketing to go from F8 to F11, you know now from this class that if I go up in those numbers, I'm gonna get more depth of field, which is gonna increase my apparent sharpness, then it would be, you would err on the side of caution by bracketing that way. You could theoretically bracket also with shutter, there's no reason why you couldn't because they're, they're, they, they relate to each other. What you do with one, you must do with the, with the other and, and conversely. Um, and what the, what the bracket with the shutter might do is, especially if you have a moving subject, you might like the effect of the slower sh shutter if you're shooting a car or you're shooting a person running and you want to get that trail and you, you like the romance of the picture not being so still. So yes, I would say, Aaron, you could, you know, depending on what you wind up shooting, experiment with both. But fundamentally, photographers will bracket on the side of aperture because they want to make sure they have something that's printable and something that's that's sharp. That's a great question, though. That makes sense. Thanks. Other, other questions at this point? Okay, let's check my notes here. Okay, so we went over fast and slow lenses, 
We've discussed the aperture. Oh yeah, here's another thing that I want you to know about lenses. Can anyone list the three groups of lenses that are available? Now that we've reviewed it, just tell me, like you're gonna buy a lens, you're gonna select the lens, name one of the groups of lenses. Telephoto. What's that? Telephoto. Telephoto. Yep. No. Macro. Macro. Correct. No. What's the third one we went over? I went over that first. Wide angle. Correct. Okay, so in these three groups, these are considered prime lenses. They're, they're considered prime lenses because they're dedicated to a specific um, view, whether it be a long view, wide view, normal view, macro view, right? Prime. There's also another type of lens that combines all of these. Can anyone name what that would be? Zoom lens. Now, traditionally, pro photographers stayed away from these. Why? Because the elements of the lens weren't as accurate as the prime lenses. So that's why I have all these lenses here. Over time, particularly in the digital world that we live in today, zoom lenses are amazingly as accurate as prime lenses. But you lose speed. They're slow, generally speaking. So that's the trade-off. So it's better when you're first starting out to learn the rudiments of photography by using prime lenses as opposed to zooms, then later on, uh, especially if you jump over to digital, uh, in fact, that's what I did when I jumped over to digital, I tested the zoom lenses and I found them to be as sharp as prime lenses that I had used previously. Okay, so we reviewed a brief history of the camera, obscura, pinhole camera, box camera, medium format, 30, 35 millimeter of the camera body, loading the film, setting the ISO. We talked about shutter speed, the interrelationship between shutter, ISO, and aperture. Camera shape, you now know anything under 60th of a second. You have to run the risk. Uh, should be on a tripod. Uh, metering. Everybody's meter is going to be a little bit different depending on whether it's a Canon or a Nikon. But the term that I always use is when we're in the field, when we're working, we want to arrive at that median exposure. That would be the even balance between negative and positive. Positive being over negative being under, middle being perfect uh, detail in the shadows, perfect detail in the highlights of your picture. Um, we talked about bracketing, how it's better to be overexposed than underexposed. You brought out the point, Aaron, of bracketing on the shutter speeds, which is an interesting concept that would play into how you want to approach your subject, whether it be mo moving or still. Cable release, that's it.
Okay, so this is a cable release. Generally, when I'm starting to get below that 60th of the second threshold and I'm working on a tripod, your camera on the top of your shutter button usually will have a little hole in it. And that's for your, if you get a cable release at the camera store, you plug that right in here. Screws in. This one seems to be stripped. It's not screwing in anymore. But anyway, usually your, your cable release button set screw is right on top of your shutter. I recommend using this even when you're on a tripod because sometimes when you're using the tripod, just the pressure of your finger on the shutter release button may cause some camera shake. So it's advisable when you're shooting slow to use this little device because what happens is when you press down on the cable release, this metal plunger comes out and engages your shutter. It's a very handy tool that I recommend everyone have. They're very inexpensive. So that you can get at the camera supply store. What else? I think I've gone over just about everything that I wanted to go over to get you started fundamentally. Uh, we still have a little bit more time. I could answer some other questions uh, with the time we have remaining. Is there any um, questions that, what should we review that you may be unsure about when you start to uh, put that camera in your hand and figuring out what you're going to do? Brooks, you have any thoughts? I, is this, all of this coming back to you? It is, yeah. You're pretty clear on anything? Is there anything that was a little fuzzy in terms of what I went over? I don't think so. Thank you, yeah. I, I don't think I have any questions. Um, yeah, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm wondering what the difference is. Like, I know you were, you're teaching another photography class too. Is that a full semester class? Yes. Got it. Yeah, that's the 200 level class which requires that you take this class first. Understood. Um, any other thoughts or questions? Would you like to see some of my early work uh, while we have a few minutes? I was gonna actually do that next week, but I think we have a little time. I wanna start on that now. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen with you. Here we go. So this was uh, actually my first individual project. Uh, it was called the House of Prayer Portfolio. I started it uh, as a college student in 1976. And then I um, uh, left graduate school in 1979 and started working professionally and went back to this uh, religious sanctuary in 1980 where my grandmother was an usher at the church. This is what I mean about your uh, opening page for your final portfolio where you have a title, uh, you have your artist statement and you have an image from the portfolio that is representative of the work when you get ready to open the portfolio to look at the pictures. And this can be printed out in the form of a PDF. So that's your cover sheet. And these are some of the pictures. Let me just go back, take this off the slide. Now these are all taken 35 millimeter. This is the exterior of the church back in 
1976. Um, I took this picture mainly to, to give a sense of place, um, the humble nature of the entrance to the church. Obviously, it's not a wealthy church. Uh, it's like a neighborhood church that belonged to uh, the apostolic faith. And so I, I used this in the beginning of the portfolio just to familiarize the viewer as to the humble nature of the congregation. And then I selected um, this picture, which was representative of the music that was played at the church. It's more or less like a still life. Um, you can see how we're starting to frame a shot how I left air around the tuba, leaving a little room at the top, not keeping the tuba too close to the top of the frame, creating a sense of balance of the musical instru instrument in the composition, uh, I was already starting to get a sense of. <clears throat> now you notice that these pictures have a coloration to them. Uh, that's because they were toned in the dark room. Uh, they started out, out as ordinary black and white film images, but I used a toning method that gave it that brownish kind of color that was enhanced also by the choice of paper. This was called a orthochromatic paper. When you start printing black and white photographs in our lab, you're gonna be using panchromatic paper. Uh, panchromatic paper means that you get a greater subtle rendition of the tonalities of the photograph from your highlight detail, which would be, you know, this part of the tuba to your deepest shadows, which would be inside the tuba itself. And in panchromatic, you would get more subtlety and more range in the shadows. Uh, orthochromatic paper would give you more of a harsher contrast, which is something I was experimenting with early on as a student. I like the uh, graphic nature that orthochromatic paper offered. Unfortunately, you, I don't even know if you can get orthochromatic paper anymore. Uh, this paper was called Ortho Standard. It was published, uh, produced by Eastman Kodak. And there were some famous photographers like Les Crims who shot all of his bodies of work using this style, this methodology. But be it became such a rare uh, commodity to purchase, it made this portfolio quite valuable. And, and rare in and of itself because of the paper it's printed on. Uh, these, everything was shot 35. And one thing that uh, I can teach you right now about when you shoot 35 full frame means that on the edges of the exposed film, you're gonna see sprocket holes generally on, on this side, on the long side of your shot. That's where the sprocket holes are registering onto the film. So when you see a full frame print, that means you're going to see black on the edges. So I learned that early on as a photographer in school, but I cropped this image. So when you crop an image, meaning that I, there was probably some extraneous information at the top of this shot that I didn't like, and I decided to crop it, but I liked the idea of having a black border around my picture. So in this case, I used the technique in the dark room to blacken the edges of the picture rather than print the negative full frame because I didn't have the option for that. So this is kind of a presentation consideration that one makes when they start to create a body of work. Uh, this photograph, and you can see from this photograph that I was using a high-speed film. I was probably using, as I recall, a Tri-X 400 and I pushed the film, which means I rated the Tri-X higher than what Kodak recommended because the church didn't have, it had some available light and the pastor uh, only agreed that I could shoot at the church without flash. So I had to shoot and I couldn't use a tripod. Those were my limitations because he didn't want any of the congregation to trip over my tripod and the church gets sued or uh, the flash would be dis uh, distracting to the congregation while they were worshiping. So I rated my film higher than 400. This looks like it could have been rated two stops faster, which would have brought me from four to eight, from eight to 1600. 
uh, which is something that you guys uh, can experiment with when you decide on your uh, ISO selection. All of the films that are available, whether they be 100 or 400, have latitude. And that's one of the beautiful qualities of black and white photography is that there's a lot of latitude and exposure, meaning that you could be a little over, you could be a little under, but you still will come away with something print, uh, printable. Whereas in color photography, it's a much more critical medium and less latitude. So I push this film as, a pull, as opposed to pulling the film. Pulling would mean that I would rate the, the film instead of at the prescribed rate of 3,200 or whatever, or let's say 400, then I would go to 200. 200, by pulling it, I would try to reduce the, the grain of the film and also minimize any chance of overexposure because of the nature of the speed of the film. So these are techniques that photographers play with when they're starting to decide on a particular direction or if they're working on a body of work that's problematic in terms of the lighting. Uh, this image was also cropped as well. As I evolved as a photographer and as I read more about uh, creating a photographic style, I started to get away from cropping my images by training my eyes on the edges of the frame and framing the shot, knowing that I'm gonna live with how I frame the shot while I'm making it as opposed to manipulating the photograph in post or in post-production. This is a true 35 millimeter full frame um, photograph, no cropping. Uh, at this point, I was starting to understand how aperture selection started to affect uh, focus. So you can see in the foreground, particularly here on the right, we're in this lower right, right-hand quadrant of the picture, it's very soft and ethereal. That's because I was not using a wide angle lens. I was not using a 20, I wasn't using a 24. I was using a 35 millimeter, which I mentioned to you is considered wide, but really is in the normal category. There's no edge distortion with any of these faces, for example. Edge distortion is something that you would get if I had shot this scene wider to create the same frame. Then you start distorting the figure as you, you've seen those kinds of pictures millions of times. So one of the things I'd like to train you how to do is proper lens selection, proper distance from subject. Uh, because I was working intimately with these folks, I, you can see that I, I tried to kind of stay away and kind of be a witness to the, uh, to the happenings there. Now, there were times when I did do more selective focus work when they were in their pews, when they were praying. I switched over here to what looks like to be an 85 millimeter lens. 85 millimeter lens, as you know, is starting to become a longer focal length lens. When you're using a longer focal length lens, the degree of sharpness that you get on your main primary subject to anything near or far starts to fall off. See, starts to fall off. So this is when focusing the camera becomes critical because you're using a longer focal length lens. You're in low light, so it's harder to see. And this is the beauty class of lens speed. This is the beauty of lens speed because with lens speed, you see through that viewfinder with 35 millimeter at the maximum aperture that you have to work with, with your lens. So if it's 1.4, you're viewing through the more brightness from the get-go than if you had a lens on there that was 2.8 or 3.5. That's why people spend the extra money for, for a, a faster lens, because if they're in a situation like this, like I was, and they've got a 3.5 lens, it's hard as hell to see. It's really hard to view it, it's hard to focus it, and it's hard to really capture it um, the, the way I was able to achieve it here, because I did have the benefit, if it was an 80, it was probably a 2.5 uh, lens, which is relatively fast. But you can see how quickly 
the depth of field falls off. Now, if I had stopped this down, if I were able to go onto a tripod, even at 3,200, I, could, I might still need to be on that tripod because at 3,200 in low light, that median exposure may have said 2.8. If I'm at 2.8 with 3,200 ISO, I have two options. Can you guys tell me what the two options are? Okay, I'll help. You can go up, up in ISO, which is a no-no for this class because that would create more what? Grain. Grain, right. So the other option would be what? If I'm locked, if I'm at my fastest lens speed at 2.8, my ISO is prefixed at whatever it is, 3,200. What's the other option to create more depth of field? You could uh, change your focal length. No, let's say I keep the focal length. I'm gonna stick with this view. I love this view, but I want more depth of field. I'm locked in right now at F2.8 at 3,200. What's my third controllable factor class? F-stop, ISO, and what? Shutter speed. Shutter speed, correct. So shutter speed then means that I can shoot slower. Now I pick up one stop because it's a factor of two. Now that image, if I keep it, Let's say this image was shot at a 60, if I was hand holding it at a 60, or better yet, I was hand holding it at 125 because I use more uh, speed on my ISO. So if I'm hand holding it at 125, now I have the latitude to slow down that shutter speed. And then you, I've taught you today that everything relates to each other. So if I'm working from 125 to a 60 of now, now I can take that 2.8 to my next f-stop, which would be 3.5. Follow me? That's how you increase depth of field in a limited situation. Now, like I said, the pastor didn't want me to be on a tripod, but if you're in a situation where you have that latitude and you like that look with that lens, then you can start to play with depth of field. The more up, the more up that number, f number you go, the more this, woman with the glasses in the background would be in sharp and, and would be sharp because of the depth of field increase because of the increase in the F number. Now, the other uh, alternative would be, of course, to change the, the lens, go with a wider length, and then I would get more depth of field inherently because the wider the angle of the lens, the more inherent depth of field. So I think this particular situation illustrates how those controllable factors come into play in real time. Now, this is a shot in, uh, in the apostolic faith where the, um, where the congregants actually start to witness and they, they go into like a spiritual uh, vibe where they sing, they shout, they pray. And this is a photograph actually of my grandmother who um, was at the church that day, but not as an usher. Uh, the ushers generally wore white. And if you were just a member of the congregation, you would dress appro appropriately. And grandma was enjoying that, that moment of exaltation that I wanted to capture sharply because she was moving. So that's where I had to make sure I was checking my shutter speed, knowing what my limitations were there. But I was lucky because even at the 60th of a second, I was able to capture her in motion, still had enough depth of field and focus with my lens to get this gentleman in the foreground in reasonable sharpness. In other words, he's not blurred out. If, the, if I used a longer lens, he would have started to get blurrier, but I used the lens that kept him relatively sharp, grandma nice and sharp, and then uh, as there's, a, there's something in with lens uh, physics called hyperfocal distance. Hyperfocal distance is called the sweet spot of focusing. And some lenses actually have uh, a, a uh, measure on the lens for hyperfocal distance. I, I haven't used that methodology in years and years, so I'm a little rusty on it, but it's something that you can read up on, particularly if you 
uh, elect to shoot like landscapes or architecture for your assignment, and you want to max out on your depth of field, then I want you to read up on hyperfocal distance because there's a way to figure out that distance, which is essentially the sweet spot of your lens in terms of creating maximum depth of field with the uh, lens selection you've made and the f-stop you've chosen. Here you can see where this congregant was moving because you can see the, the blurriness of his hand. So in this situation, you can see I used, I probably used a 24 millimeter lens in this case. Now, lens selection has no impact on movement, right? Lens selection only has impact on focus and view. So I had to live with what I was given since I wanted to, to capture this uh, view of the church when the ushers were coming up the middle aisles and going into their position before the service started and maybe the music was playing from the band and this congregate is seated and he's moving about. So uh, that's something that you, you know, is, a, is an aesthetic choice. I had to live with that. That's a split second decision that I'm making while I'm shooting. I could have went with a faster slutter, shutter speed but I, I kind of liked it that way. I like the sense of motion because this whole service was all about uh, move, movement and shouting and dancing. And this is another congregant dancing in the middle of the service. Um, it's a little soft, but because of the nature of the orthochromatic paper I was using and the developer that I was using, I was able, when you look at the actual prints, even though on this screen it appears soft, the grain is sharp. So sometimes when you're doing moving pictures, if the grain is sharp and the subject is a little soft, that you'll arrive at an, aesthetic, at an aesthetic decision where you say, you know, I see a little blurriness, but the focus doesn't bother me. I'm gonna live with it. It's part of the feeling of the picture. I like it. Now, this is a picture where you'll learn when you get in the dark room, in this case, uh, let's say I was using 3200, I'd have to look at my notes and remember for sure. But assuming it was at 3200, you might be able to notice on your screen that the grain is more prominent in this picture. There's, there's, there's really two reasons why. One, the nature of the orthochromatic paper, the contrasty paper brings out the grain. And the second thing is, which is something that you're gonna learn when you go in lab, is that when you print, when you enlarge a print, the further you rack up the enlarger, so if, if my lower hand is the plane in which you're gonna put your light sensitive paper and your enlarger and negative is up here at my, the top of my hand, the further you go up the rack of the enlarger, the more distance from the lens to the uh, unexposed paper you go, will create more grain, will bring out more grain. So this is why photographers who prop their work routinely, who know, oh, uh, you know, I'm not gonna worry about, you know, uh, being a full frame photographer. Uh, I'm gonna use the craft in post to correct my mistakes. They tend to go with slower speed films because they know in the dark room, they may be cropping and racking. And when you're cropping and racking a picture in the uh, dark room process, you will have um, more grain. Grain, by the way, is something that has always been a part of my oof some, from the time I was in college to now. And when I published uh, my photographic books, they were all grainy pictures. So it's something that I know quite well and have mastered. Um, this particular picture was an accident, and it was, a, uh, it was, I saw it when I made my contact sheet, and, but the reason why it wound up in the portfolio, I mean, this whole body of work is part of a spiritual exercise, you know, in, in religion, religious practice, and when I was advancing my film, pastor didn't want me to use a, a, a motor drive because they're noisy, so I was hand advancing the film and what can happen with manual cameras is that when you advance the film sometimes when you 
uh, enter it on the spool, you think you're advancing it to one where you haven't advanced it at all. So I had started a roll and I thought I had advanced this to one and I literally was creating a double exposure. And I thought, about, I must have thought about it because this was the only one that I had. So I, in that case, I kept the picture, spooled it back up, processed it, got this. So you can see in this picture, two faces. Do you guys see it? There's a face here and there's a face there, but I love the way it kind of morphed into like the spiritual photograph in a way. So it's very, what I call an ethereal picture. And I kept it as a, as a winner for that body of work. So this was the work I did as an undergraduate student. Um, uh, I picked my grandmother's church and that portfolio was strong enough to get me admitted into graduate school where I went to RIT. So the point being that, you know, even when you're doing work as a college student, you never know where your work lands. You know, whether it's in writing, math, anything that you're studying, take, take it seriously. Like take everything that you do. You may not even be sure at this point in your lives, you know, what you wanna be when you're out of college, but like every class you take, think of it in terms of the long run. Um, that's what I did when I got into photography, and now I'm showing this work 40 some years later to my students. So I get a lot of pleasure out of that because you, now you can see how uh, a photographer grows and evolves. Now, with respect to final portfolio presentations, this is my version of a portfolio case. Uh, it's a custom made case. There's a company in New York called Brewer and Contelmo. They're very famous, they've been in business for well over a hundred years. This is where all the uh, prominent photographers go that, that want to present to museums or galleries or whatever. And uh, so this case has embossing of the, my name and title and the years the picture were taken on the cover. And that I, I think is very important. It, it's not a requirement for your work, but I just wanted to show you what the next level, what that would look like. This is a clamshell paste. So this case opens up and lays flat on the surface where it was photographed and then the prints are obviously contained inside. And this distance that I was mentioning is three inches to accommodate about 20 prints. So years later, I went back four years later. Uh, okay, here's where I start. Four years later, uh, I um, graduated from college and I wanted to keep doing my individual projects. So I went back to the church. And this time I went with an eight by 10 view camera. So like I said, in the beginning of today's class, it's the four by five, but mega size, eight by 10 negative. It renders the most detail you'll ever see in a photograph. So when we actually start meeting in class, I'll bring this portfolio in so that you can see the detail that you can get from a, from a large format negative. And I went back in 1980 to do this series of portraits of the congregation uh, with a flash equipment. This time I was able to get permission from the church to use uh, flash photography. Uh, it was the pictures were taken after or before service. I had literally had a studio set up at the church over a period of time. I must have gone back half a dozen times to create about 45 eight by 10 contact portraits of the congregation. And um, if you look at my hand illustration with enlarging, top hand being the enlarger head with the 35 millimeter negative, bottom hand being the light sensitive paper. When I refer to the technique of contact printing, that means you have the luxury when you're working with a large format negative, whether it be four by five or eight by 10, you have the luxury of laying the negative flat on the paper. Then you would put a sheet of glass over the paper and negative and make your exposure from there. So there's no diffusion between the enlarger head and the exposure of the paper, you follow me? When you create distance between that negative 
and the unexposed photographic paper, you're also creating diffusion. That's part of the physics of photography. So purists, when you start reading about in these books that I'm asking that you read, when you start reading about like the end of the 19th century, when these groups were formed, there was the pictorialist school, the pictorialists were into soft focus. So they liked uh, wide open lenses. They didn't like being down on the other side and they liked selective focus. That was the pictorialist. And what I'm referring to here, when we're talking about contact printing, which is what I would did, did here, that was the F64 school of thought where they use the maximum aperture, which yields the most depth of field and the most detail, right? No fall off and contact printing formed a whole different school. So in this one portfolio, I combined really a couple different schools of thought but it still formed a cohesive body of work in terms of the presentation and the subject matter was, was the same. It was all part of the uh, congregation of this church. What did now, you your go ahead. Before you took pictures of them, like what was their prompt when they were when you're taking pictures of them. Did you yeah, I was just going to get to that. I just want to take a, take a second just to explain to you technically without you knowing anything about flash photography. Okay, but you're starting to learn something about lenses, right? And f-stops and shutter speeds. So with the four by five, because they're leaf shutters, you can, you can pre-select your shutter speed, work within whatever is comfortable for you. So let's just say I use an ISO 100, You've learned today that 100 means very little grain in the structure of the film. And I set my preset my um, shutter speed at 125 so as to minimize any possibility of camera shake, even though with the four by five, you're required to be on a tripod. So I'm grounded, okay? I'm absolutely grounded. Now, when you're dealing with these factors, you're going to read about a phenomenon in photography called reciprocity. Reciprocity is the time, light delay from the lens plane to the film plane. So that's reciprocity. That means that once that light hits the lens, it's going to take, even though light travels at, a, at an incredibly fast speed, it's still nevertheless within this darkened chamber creates reciprocity, which means that the more you extend the bellows, there's more reciprocity. Also, the more you extend the bellows, it shortens the depth of field on the view camera. So I had to calculate a methodology to do these eight by 10 portraits of people with close up. Now remember now, when you're further back from any subject, you have more inherent depth of field, whether you're using a telephoto lens or a wide angle lens. The closer you get to the subject, the more you have to learn how to control your controllable factors, i.e. in this case, lens selection and f-stop selection. So with that said, This is a bird's eye view of how I did. Can you see the board? Okay, bird's eye view. Black background. Subjects. Now I'm gonna teach you this in the lighting class, but very quickly. Subject, you have to determine how far you want the subject from your background because lens sex selection will play into the factor of whether you want the background sharp or not. Right? So it's not a random decision how far back I put that background to make sure it was black. I didn't want any detail in it, nothing. 
So place the subject here, cameras here. Now I have to deal with lighting. And I'll get into lighting. I think lighting is actually next, next week. So I place what's called a soft box to the left side. You can see when you look at the picture, the key light is on the left side of the boy. Right side is the chiaroscuro side where it gets light and dark. So one light. Now you're going to ask me, I'm indoors. I had no window light. So I had to use two, one or two types of lights, either a flash or an incandescent light. So I used an incredible piece of flash equipment that rendered an output of light from this one light source at 9,600 watt seconds. So flash light, flash photography is measured in watt seconds. And that's a, a very involved uh, scientific methodology uh, regarding this. So just take it for granted. 9,600 watt seconds is like lightning when, it, when it's fired. For example, your little, like on your, on your uh, digital cameras when you use your flash function, that's like two watt seconds, or maybe, maybe it's five or 10 watt seconds. So imagine 9,600 watt seconds. So when you're generating that much electricity with flash equipment, you need special packs. So I used 2,400 watt seconds of power from packs and I divided the power between the packs. I had to actually use three of them, two, four, six. So I had to use four 2,400 watt second packs to be able to dial down the 9,600, which gave me or helped me arrive at the proper shutter speed and F number to get immediate exposure. So here's the other, here's the other catch. Here's the other catch. When you're using large format cameras, you have to stop the lens down and put your film holder in before you take the picture. So how do you get the picture sharp? So I had to, this is where you learn how to become a director as a photographer. You explain to the talent, hey, uh, I'm going to get under a hood. You've seen, you've all seen pictures of photographers under black cloths when they're using these old fashioned cameras. That's to enable them to photograph, to focus on, on the ground glass, get the picture sharp. Now, You've learned today that you can only see through the lens at its fastest F number. So for example, on this particular lens, it's 5.6 class. That's slow as hell, 5.6. That's really slow. You've already learned 1.4, F2, F2.8, 3.5, 4. It's six stops slower than most 35 millimeter lenses. So what did I do? So I train, I told the models, I'm going to take two shots. I'm going to turn a, a bright light on because they, they didn't see the flash go off until I, after I took the picture. But I had a, a second light next to that reflector that was a tungsten lamp, an incandescent bulb at a thousand watts. So when I turned that on, it lit up the whole room, got under the ground glass. I said, now look, I'm going to focus the camera now it sharp as a tack, right? Now you're focusing at the widest F number. So you know, if, and this is the thing about shooting portraits I want you to remember. When you shoot portraits, focus on the eyelashes. So if the eyelashes are sharp, you know the face is going to be sharp. So I focused on the eyelashes under the ground glass and, they, and they're special uh, magnifiers that we use to put on the back so it blows it up. And I said, look, now stay still. I'm going to stop my lens down 
to my required F number, which in this case was 45, stopped it down, then I took the picture, took the film slide out, then I took the picture. So this is an, it look, these pictures look simple, but they're incredibly hard to make. Now, one of the beauties of this, but look like you can even see the sweat on her face because it was hot in the church that day. And you could see cataracts in people's eyes. I mean, it was, this is like the mega way to shoot if you like detail. And so, yeah, I think that's a good way to, to kind of summarize uh, what I did, you know, in the early days of my photography, there's, there's my grandmother again. Now, all these years later, as a parting note, the, the reason why we archive as professionals, as fine artists, is we never know if, you, if you've created a, a unique individual body of work, you never know where that work will wind up. Now, these pictures have appeared in magazines and articles about me early on and so forth and so on, but they've never been exhibited permanently anywhere. They're not in any museums. I've kind of kept this body of work like deep in the archives until about four years ago. Because what happens with photographers is we always want to be working on the current, not working on the past, right? So, you know, it's part of the collection, but one day an artist friend calls me up and says, Tony, they're building a new convention center in Philadelphia, a new wing to our convention center from 13th Street to Broad. And there's a call for artists to sell pictures to the convention bureau to go on permanent, permanent display because they have a 2% allotment for the total budget of the project towards the art. That's what happens a lot these days to support uh, the art world. So he said, but the, the only parameters of the theme to enter this base, essentially it was a contest, was that it had to be a Philadelphia theme and a light bulb went off in my head. And I said, oh my God, house of prayer. I got to submit the house of prayer. I could only submit four photographs. No, I think it was five, five photographs. Yeah, it was five photographs. So I submitted five photographs and these four were selected out of, I mean, it was like, imagine all the artists in Pennsylvania hearing about this opportunity to be on the permanent display at the Philadelphia Convention Center. It's like, you know, you know how many millions of people will see this body of work now? So I, after this happened, and this happened in 2016, I went back to the convention center after we did the installation and this is actually how it looks. If you ever go through the ground floor of the new wing, you'll see this there and there's a plaque that will be there forever. So it's, it's just like amazing, like how much reach one has if you create a unique individual body of work. So I'll, I'll leave you on that note class. Oh, and also I'll leave you on one monetary note. These four prints were purchased for $20,000. So it was $5,000 a print. And the way I value my work and with any, any art, like when you, if you start, if you decide to become a fine artist like Cindy has, over time, your work will become valuable if you get published, if you, if you write, you know, if you publish enough books, you get exhibitions, you start to build a curriculum vitae. And then you start placing value. And the reason why I valued them is because first of all, I knew that they had money. And secondly, I knew how rare this exercise was. It just simply, you just don't see pictures like this done that way of the congregation, of an African-American congregation. So that's how I started to value my work. So value your work by thinking about your individual project, Think, of, think about it as a body of work, not only that you will produce now, but you'll also enjoy looking at as you get older and more mature. And you may not even be a photographer, but I guarantee you, photography will always be in your life in some way because we live in a, in a media world. So 
Next week, I'll see you same time, same station. Uh, start your reading, start thinking about that individual project. And within two weeks, I, I expect you to have film exposed. If we're looking at the schedule. Yeah, so, right. So yeah, in two weeks, I expect you to have started exposing your film for your individual project. And then when we start getting in lab, we're going, to, we're going to process the negatives, make contact prints, and start printing. So that's when the class is going to go, boom, we're going to just start rolling, right? So in the meantime, between now and next week, I want you to contemplate, what is it that I, under these uh, limited conditions, can I look at in my environment that I love? And it could be the simply, it, it might be the Lutnick Library. It might be um, where you live. It might be your favorite student on campus. You wanna do a series about them. Maybe they have some unusual background. You might wanna do something on COVID that's COVID related. You might wanna take 20 pictures of African-American students who were part of the, the boycott. You know, it could, you have a lot of thinking to do right now, class. Think about now and think about the future because that's what photography is back about. It's always about looking at the past and enjoying it, enjoying it, the past. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed um, spending these few moments uh, with you. And oh, just while we have a couple more minutes. So I went to the convention center and they, they interviewed me for this body of work. So I'm just gonna show uh, this to you. It only runs a couple minutes. My name is Tony Ward. I'm a Philadelphia based artist. What really inspired me to become a, an artist was my father, uh, Milton Adolph Ward. When he was a young man, uh, he had a lot of artistic talents, but because of segregation in the South, he was really forced to flee with my grandmother and his younger brother to pursue better, better opportunities. So he wound up in South Philly at Fleischer Memorial Art Center. And when I was a little boy, he would come home from work. And because he liked what he did for a living, he would use his skills at home to make extra money to feed the family. And that's when I really learned how to compose images. And what I love about creating art is always an interesting way to look at the past. I mean, people take pictures in the present, but we're really what they're doing is they're encapsulating a certain moment in their past that they want to have memorialized in some way. And grandma would always say, you know, Anthony, why don't you bring your camera to church? And that was the initiation of learning about photographing documentary series in a, in a church environment. When I saw the pictures home for the first time, you know, I've had a lot of great moments in my career over 40 years of being a professional photographer. That was one of those moments because it really said to me in a way you've arrived and a, and a beautiful thing about that is, is I wasn't dead to know that I had arrived because I saw a plaque with my name and it had the date of birth, but not the year he passed, thank God. <laughs> and then the other recognition, of course, from that was when my daughter, who happened to be in a meeting here in the convention center, didn't know that the pictures were up. And she took a selfie with her father's pictures at the convention center, which like blew her mind. I really wanted people of color to have an opportunity to have a voice equal to everybody else. So to have a permanent place where people of color's voices are being heard through these pictures, you can't replace that with anything. It's just infinitely uh, rewarding. All right. So uh, again, great to work with you guys today and uh, see you next week. Uh, and again, if you have any follow-ups or any questions regarding our next meeting or anything on your mind, just feel free to hit me up. We can do a personal Zoom or we can do an email, okay? Thank See you. you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Tony, I just sent you an email about a listing on eBay.